the phenomenon has a mark and a manifestation. It is conditioned. The phenomenon is the doctrine underlying any phenomenal event. For example, in principle, a tree has the potential to become a house. Before the house is built, it has not that it has that nominal aspect. Once built, the house itself is the phenomenon which appears because of the nominon. In principle, we can all realize Buddhahood, but when we have not phenomenally done so, if we have faith. Vows and hold the name. We will arrive at the phenomenon of Buddhahood, just as the tree can be made into a house. Amitabha Buddha is contained within the hearts of all living beings, and living beings are contained within Amitabha's heart. This is the phenomenon and the phenomenon. You must believe in the doctrine and energy. Tickly practice it by reciting the Buddha's name more and more every day. When one recites Namo Amitabha Buddha in the western land of ultimate bliss, in one of the pools of the seven jewels filled with the eight waters of merit and virtue, a lotus flower grows. The more one recites, the bigger it grows, but it won't bloom until the end of life. When one's self nature goes to be reborn in it, if you wish to know whether you will be born in superior, middle, or inferior grade of lotus, you should ask yourself how often you recite the Buddha's name. The more you recite, the bigger the lotus. The less you recite, the smaller. If you don't recite at all, the lotus withers and dies. To be reborn in the land of ultimate bliss, you must personally give proof to the results with deep faith, firm vows, and the actual practice of recitation. It won't work to think, "I'll sleep in today and cultivate tomorrow." If, however, you hold fast to the name and cultivate vigorously, success is certain. Vows. Having discussed faith, we will now discuss vows. What is a vow? What you wish? The tendency of your thoughts is a vow. In Buddhism, there are four great vows. I vow to save the limitless living beings. I vow to cut off the inexhaustible afflictions. I vow to study the immeasurable Dharma doors. I vow to realize the supreme Buddha way. All Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of the past, present, and future practiced the Bodhisattva conduct and attained Buddhahood by relying on these four great vows. You may make the four great vows according to the four holy truths. According to the truth of suffering, I vow to save the limitless living beings. According to the truth of origination, I vow to cut off. The inexhaustible afflictions, according to the truth of the way, I vow to study the immeasurable Dharma doors. According to the truth of extinction, I vow to realize the supreme Buddha way. The four great vows come from an awareness of the suffering of living beings. For purposes of clarification, suffering is divided into groups of the three, eight, and limitless sufferings. According to the truth of origination, I vow to cut off the inexhaustible afflictions. The three sufferings are suffering within suffering. This is the poverty and misery of all living beings. The suffering of decay. Living beings may enjoy wealth and honor, but it eventually goes bad. The suffering of process. Even without the sufferings of poverty and decay. The bitterness of the life process, from birth to the prime of life, to old age, and then to death, is still suffering. The shift and change of each passing thought is called the suffering of process. The eight sufferings are the suffering of birth, the suffering of old age, the suffering of sickness, the suffering of death. It was because Shakyamuni Buddha met with these four sufferings. 
that he decided to live the whole life and cultivate the way. The suffering of separation from what you love, the suffering of being joined with what you hate. If people are not apart from loved ones, they are involved with enemies. If you don't like someone, you find someone just like him wherever you go. The suffering of not realizing aspirations. You worry about getting something, and once you have it, you worry about losing it. This suffering is nothing compared to the next. The suffering of the raging blaze of the five skandhas, form, feelings, perceptions, impulses, and consciousness. The five skandhas are like a raging fire. They are a constant shadow which we cannot escape. According to the truth of suffering, I vow to save the limitless living beings. Why are there limitless with sufferings besides these eight. In the past lives, we planted the seeds of suffering as if we were old friends with which we were loath to part. Having established causes and conditions for suffering in the past, in the present, we reap a bitter fruit. From causes made in lives gone by comes your present life. Results you get in life to come arise from this life's in uh, life's deeds plant good causes reap good results plant bad causes reap bad results you fear the results oh i'm suffering too bitterly you say but you suffer because previously you planted the causes and uh, the causes of suffering living beings fear the results not the causes from which they come But bodhisattvas fear the causes, not the results. Bodhisattvas are extremely careful not to plant the causes of suffering, and so they do not reap the harvest of suffering. They endure their present suffering gladly. So bodhisattvas too must sometimes sometimes suffer, but they do so willingly, knowing that enduring suffering and suffering. Enjoying blessings destroys blessings. Living beings, on the other hand, are not afraid to plant the causes of suffering. Good causes, bad causes, it doesn't matter. They say, "I do it anyway. It's not important." But when the results come, oh, I can't stand it. They mourn. How could this happen to me? Such a bitterness. If you feel suffering. You should not plant the causes of suffering, for if you do, you will certainly reap its bitter fruit. Born in the land of ultimate bliss, one endures no suffering but enjoys every bliss. None of the three sufferings, eight sufferings, or the limitless sufferings are found there at all. The people are pure and free of greed, hatred, and stupidity. Without the three poisons, there are no evil paths. Of rebirth, because the evil paths are but manifestations of the poisons. The Buddha saves living beings, but in reality, there is not a single living being that he saves. He resolves to lead everyone to understand the Buddha Dharma in order to leave suffering, attain bliss, and wake up. But when you take beings across, do not become attached to the mark of taking beings across. Take living beings across, but be apart from marks. Leave marks yet. Take beings across. Do not attach to some mark or sign of what you do and say. Let's see. I've said three, four, six, seven, at least ten living beings. If you keep count, you've still got attachments. Save yet. Do not save. Do not save yet. Save. This is true. Crossing over. You must save the living beings within your own self nature as well as those outside. There are eighty four thousand living beings in your self nature. Teach teach them to cultivate, realize Buddhahood, and enter Nirvana. If you decide to save living beings, you will encounter afflictions. If you don't save them, you will also have afflictions. Either way, you will have afflictions. 
because there are 84,000 kinds of affliction. There are three delusions, delusions of views and thought, delusions of lack, of lack of dust and sand, delusion of ignorance. Living beings have all three types of delusions. Those of the small vehicle have cut off the delusion of views and thought, but retain the delusions like dust and sand and the delusions of ignorance. Bodhisattvas have cut off both the delusions of views and thought and the delusion like dust and sand, but they still have delusions of ignorance. Even Bodhisattvas at the stage of equal enlightenment who are just about to realize Buddhahood still have one particle of production mark. Ignorance has fine, as fine as a hair which they have not yet destroyed. This particle once destroyed, they attain the wonderful enlightenment of Buddhahood. The delusion of views refers to the greed, to greed and love for externals. Because external objects are not viewed as empty, they are recognized as real. Clothing, food and sleep seem very real. It's true, you say, I'm all alone, I have no friends or relatives. This confused state is the delusion of views. Not understanding what you are, you are greedy for comfort and good things. I love this and I love that. You say, and your endless love keeps you, keeps you dissatisfied and greedy for externals. This is the delusion of views. The delusion of thought consists in being confused about principles and giving rise to discrimination. I don't know what's going on here, someone says. Is the drama master right if I do what he says? What's in it for me? You constantly calculate about personal advantage and if there's nothing in it for you, you don't want to do it. You can't see more than three inches beyond your face. Anything four inches away, you cannot see. Thought delusions are unclear, muddled thoughts, taking what is wrong as right and what is right as wrong. I just said that people with few delusions think clothing, food, and sleep are real. Someone may ask if they are false, and if so, then what is true? These things are all necessities, but if you attach no importance to them, you are realized and free. Whenever there is attachment, there is pain. If you take it all as unreal, there will be no greed or love, and you will see that your former greed and love were nothing but confused actions in a dream. You should think of them in this way. Put everything down, let it all go. If you can't put it down, you're attached and nothing goes right. There are 88 parts of the delusion of views and 81 parts to the delusion of thought. When the delusion of views it is destroyed, you certify to the first fruit of archery. If not, there is no certification. Do you have greed and love for externals? Are you greedy for good things and repulsed by the bad? Absolutely not, you say. How do you know you are not? If you really didn't love the good and hate the bad, you wouldn't know it. If you say, I know for certain that I have but one greed or of love, then your greed and love, that I have no greed or love, then your greed and love is greater than anyone else. Why? Because you know that you have none. If you really had none, you wouldn't know and that you didn't. If you say that you have no self, how do you know that you have no self? Knowing that you have no self, you still have yourself. 
If you say that you have no greed or love, you still have a self, and you haven't cut off the 88 parts of the delusion of views, and you haven't certified to the fr first fruit of ahadship, it is not simply a matter of saying it and making it so. You must truly attain this state. The delusion of views contains the five quick servants, and the delusions of thought contain the five dumb servants. The five dumb servants are greed, hatred, stupidity, pride, and doubt. The five quick servants are said to be quick because they arrive very fast. The five dumb servants arrive more slowly. The five quick servants are the view of a body because one is a test one thinks this is my body and I'm so thin I'm not eating right I'm not properly dressed and I don't have a decent place to live how can I take care of my body the text to the body and holding a view of a body one skims for it all day long the view of extremes to become attached to either of the two extreme views of permanence or annihilation is to indulge in this view. Attached to annihilation, one says people die and that's that, everything returns to emptiness. Attached to permanence, one says next life I'll be a person again, people are always people and dogs are always dogs, cats are always cats, horses are always horses, trees are always trees, grass is always grass. People can't become cats and cats can't return into people. People can't turn into animals or ghosts. This is a fixed eternal unchanging principle permanence. Annihilation and permanence are extreme views. They are not in the middle way. Devian views, those with Devian views say that when one does good, there is no good retribution. And when one does evil, there is no evil retribution. They deny because an effect, deny cause and effect, and do not believe that by doing good deeds, one obtains blessings, and by doing evil deeds, one occurs disaster. The views of restrictive morality. This is to take a non, non, non-existent cause for a true cause. For example, teaching others to imitate the conduct of dogs and cats, or to imitate cows and eat grass instead of food. Having seen a dog or cat reborn in the heavens, one may want to imitate a dog or cat and thereby hold devil knowledge and views. Sometimes, people who have left the home life are attested to keep the precepts. I hold the precepts, they brag. I am a precept holder and these are the precepts I hold. Because there is a holder and that which is held. They do not understand that the basic substance of morality is empty. They shouldn't have attachments, but they do. And this turns into this servant. servant. The view of grasping at views here, a non-existent effect, is taken to be a true effect. The non-ultimate is considered to be ultimate. The four dhyanas of the four stations of emptiness are mistaken for nirvana. In the first dhyana, the pound stops. In the second dhyana, the breath stops. One sits without breathing. But if one thinks, I'm not breathing, then the breath starts up again. In the third dhyana, there is no thought. In the first and second, also there is neither pause or no breath. Thinking continues. In the third, there isn't even any thought. In the fourth, dhyana, there isn't any fine thought, only consciousness. In the third dhyana, although there is no cause thought, fine thought remains. In the fourth, fine thought is also cut off. These are just states. They are not the ultimate goal of conservation, which is classification to the fruit. 
even the four stations of emptiness, the station of infinite space, the station of infinite consciousness, the station of nothing whatever, and the station of neither perception nor non-perception. What are not certification to the fruit? They are simply levels of samadhi. Those who hold the view of grasping at views think that they are both mentioned states of nirvana, like the untutored bhikshu who mistook the fourth dhyana heaven to the fourth fruit of a hardship, and the marriage which had enabled him to dwell there was used up and he started to fall. He slandered the drama and because of this he fell into hell. The five quick servants are the delusion of views and are called quick because they are they arrive quickly, referring to the delusion of thought and arriving more slowly are the five dark servants. Greed, hatred, stupidity, pride, doubt. Afflictions come from ignorance. When the delusions of ignorance arise, delusions like dust and sand follow. The delusions like dust and sand are called the delusions of I don't know because there is no genuine knowledge. The delusions of views and thoughts are called the delusions of I don't see. Ignorance turns into the first of the five dark servants, greed. When you want something, greed arises, and with it come all the various afflictions. The afflictions turn into hatred, and you argue on your own behalf, never seeing the other person's side. You only know yourself and are unaware that other people exist except in attempting to ruin them. In this way, reckless and unreasonable, you become stupid, unable to tell black from white, right from wrong. Stupid people are arrogant, and no matter what you say, they doubt it. They doubt the truth and doubt the false even more. All these doubts are the delusions of thought, the three categories of delusions, those of views and thought, dust and sand and ignorance all change into affliction. Afflictions are inexhaustible and endless. Observing this, cultivators vow, according to the truth of origination, I vow to cut off the inexhaustible afflictions. According to the truth of the way, I vow to study the immeasurable Dharma doors. To cultivate the way, you must understand all of the limitless and unbounded Dharma doors, which are the methods of cultivation. Unless you understand them, you cannot cultivate. Relying on the third holy truth, the way, vow to study them. What is the origin of the Dharma doors? The Buddha spoke all dharmas for the minds of men. If there were no minds, what use would dharmas be? All dharmas come from the minds of living beings, and each mind is unique. Since no two minds are alike, all dharma does differ. Generally speaking, however, there are three classes of dharmas, Buddha dharma, mind dharma, dharma of living beings. Within the three classes arise the four holy truths, the six perfections and the twelve causes and conditions, and the thirty-seven limbs of enlightenment. So many Dharma doors. Take, for example, my explanations of the sutras. When I finish explaining one sutra, I begin another, and sooner have I finished that one, and I start yet another. Isn't this measureless? What we now study is like a drop of water in the sea, and we certainly haven't got the entire ocean. Vow to master the immeasurable Dharma doors. What are the advantages of studying the Buddha Dharma? You ask. It's a lot of trouble, you know. We study the Buddha Dharma because we want to realize Buddhahood, but isn't wanting the to realize Buddha who just another false thought? No, it's not a false thought. Buddhahood was our position to begin with. It is our origin. 
consequently everyone can realize widowed but and and we should hurry up and do just that but how according to the truth of extinction i vow to realize the supreme buddha way the truth of extinction is the attainment of nirvana a realization which carries one beyond production and extinction if this attainment is your wish resolve to cultivate the supreme buddha way don't be skeptical and ask can i really become a buddha even if you have doubts you can become a buddha it will take a little longer that's all without doubts you can do it right away all living beings have the buddha nature and all can realize buddhahood but this does not mean that all beings are buddhas to arrive at buddhahood you must cultivate for without cultivation living beings are just living beings not buddhas in principle everyone can become a buddha but unless you cultivate according to dharma and rid yourself of greed hatred stupidity pride and doubt you won't become a buddha very fast this completes the discussion of the four vast vows if you wish to accomplish something you should first make a vow then act upon it in this way you will naturally attain your aim this principle is illustrated by the following story once shakyamuni buddha and his disciple mahamaudyadhyana went to a large gathering of flowers to another country to another county to convert living beings when the citizens saw the buddha they shut the doors and ignored him when they saw maudgaliyana however they ran to greet him and everyone from the king and ministers to the citizens all bowed and completed to and competed to make offerings to him the buddha's disciples thought this most unfair world or not one they said your virtuous conduct is so lofty why is it they do not do not make offerings to you but instead compete to make offerings to maudga vyayana this is because of past affinities said the buddha i will tell you limitless ends ago maudga vyayana and i were fellow countrymen he gathered firewood in the mountains and i lived in the hut below a swarm of bees was bothering me and i decided to smoke them out but maudgaliyana refused to help even though they stung him until his hands were swollen and painful instead he made a vow it must be miserable to be a bee he thought i vowed that when i attain the way i will take these asura like bees across first thing Many lifetimes after the bees were reborn as the citizens of this country the queen bee became the king the drones became the ministers and the workers became became the citizens because i didn't like the bees i now have no affinity with these people and therefore no one makes offerings to me but because of these vows all the citizens revere maudgaliyana considering this we should certainly make vows to establish affinities in order to benefit living creatures the eightfold division or eight classes of supernatural beings are gods dragons yaksha ghosts gandavas musical spirits kinaras also musical spirits asuras beings who like to fight garudas great golden-winged birds and mahoragas giant snakes